Some of you may be thinking, why is that guy in the bath with a load of mixed herbs and pepper? Many of you will recognise it as just good seasoning and not question it any further. I like you people. I'm well seasoned, of course, because it's the best way to explain how life began. Check this out. This is just a normal droplet of washing up liquid. Look what happens. Pretty cool, right? I'll come back to how that's even cooler than it looks later on. But first, how common is life? New life is beginning all the time across the galaxy. Oh wait, no it isn't. According to all of the evidence that we've ever gathered, life is an endangered species. Life on Earth, as far as we know, as far as we have any evidence for, is the only life that exists in the entire universe. People often argue that with so many planets in the universe, there must be life somewhere. And it sounds like quite a reasonable way to think, but how likely or unlikely is life in the first place? And are there enough planets out there to make up for how unlikely it might be? Our galaxy is so huge that it takes 120,000 years to get across it at the speed of light, the fastest that anything can possibly go. And inside our galaxy, there are about 100 billion planets, which sounds like a lot, but it's about a 30th of the number of trees there are on planet Earth. Also remember that only a tiny fraction of those planets will have conditions anything like ours on Earth. Like, check out our own solar system. Mars has no atmosphere because it's got no magnetic field, and Jupiter, if you tried to land on Jupiter, you would just keep sinking down and down and down into the gas, never reaching any solidity until you were completely crushed, with rains of diamonds coming down above you as well. All of these planets would be absolutely rubbish, basically impossible to live on. Still, there are also billions of galaxies out there, so surely that should make up for how unlikely life is, right? Maybe. Let's go right back to the beginning. How did life begin? The first key point is that life has to be self-contained. So either in cells or, in the case of your friendly neighbourhood mould, in hyphae, which are basically like really long cells. This self-containment is called compartmentalization. Next, what does it mean to be alive? We learn loads of different things at school about what it might mean to be alive, but I think the best definition is by our boy, Schrodinger. Schrodinger said that everything alive reduces the entropy inside itself. Entropy is essentially the physics word for chaos and disorder. It also happens to be one of my favourite words, like apricity. It's really special that life reduces the chaos and disorder inside itself, because one of the single most important laws of the universe is that chaos and disorder always increase overall. And yet somehow life uses food to decrease the disorder and chaos inside itself. In exchange, living things create loads of chaos and disorder around them to make sure that overall chaos and disorder is increasing. It's completely natural as a living thing to create chaos and disorder around you. To reduce the chaos inside yourself, there needs to be an inside, which is why we need compartmentalism. So how did compartmentalism begin? It began with a mediumly complex and delicious molecule called surfactant. Surfactant is also the active ingredient in washing up liquid. Thanks to life, surfactants are now incredibly common. But how common were they before life? Well, they weren't. Zoomed in, surfactants look like this. They have a head that absolutely loves water, and they have a tail that hates water, which is why the only place they can ever be happy is on the surface between water and something else. That's why the herbs and the pepper were so mercilessly swept aside, because the surfactants dominate the surface incredibly quickly considering the fact that they're tiny molecules. So that's the surfactant basics, but how does this lead to compartmentalization? When you have some submerged oil, or oily filth, in water, the surfactants have somewhere else that they're happy to sit, on the surface between the water and the oil. But they very quickly run out of surface that they're happy to sit on. How do they respond then? Enterprise! They start changing the shape of the oil droplets to make them smaller to increase the surface area so they've got more places to sit. 
This makes it ideal for surfactants to be used as washing up liquid because you turn those big droplets of oil into tiny little ones that you can then wash away. It doesn't stop there though. There's one more step that these crafty surfactant molecules can take to increase the surface area of the oil droplets. Sometimes, because of the chaos of the water, and just by sheer fortune, they'll manage to turn the oil into this shape. It's called a liposome. It's a bubble of oil in water, stabilised by surfactants on the inside and the outside of the surface. It looks suspiciously similar to a living cell. Liposomes are one of the very first necessary building blocks of life arguably the first. What I'm saying is that it's not impossible that you could randomly create life in your washing up bowl. What I want you to do now is consider how enormously unlikely it is that a random molecule like a surfactant could have come to being in the early oceans at all. I mean, they're really common now because life creates them, but back then, why would they appear? Now, considering how unlikely it is that surfactants form in the first place, Consider how enormously unlikely it is that enough surfactants would come together in a small enough space that they might somehow create a liposome. Now consider the staggering unlikeliness that one of these liposomes might randomly form around a bunch of random chemicals that somehow does some kind of reaction that might one day be useful to something that might be described as life. It's unfathomably unlikely. So now consider how unlikely it is that by some unbelievable fortune, these chemicals could be doing some kind of reaction that is actually sucking in some kind of primitive fuel, like sulfur from a volcanic vent, and pushing out the waste products in a way that is sustainable long term. And if you think that's ridiculously unlikely, consider how overwhelmingly unlikely it is that a sufficiently vast number of these special reacting liposomes form such that one of them has some kind of mechanism by which it can replicate itself. Once we have this special self-replicating liposome, life starts to become a lot more reasonable. We can start to understand how it goes from there to living things like us. But it's that first bit that is so unlikely. It's very, very plausible that the reason we find no signs of life anywhere in the universe that we look yet is less to do with the fact that life elsewhere is not becoming intelligent enough to travel or communicate, but that life is just not beginning to evolve at all anywhere. Thanks for watching. Spread the knowledge. Deliciously subscribe for more. And follow me on my Snapchat and my Instagram, at Matthew Shribman, for my facts in the shower and my animal interviews and stuff.